Good morning, Luge fans from around the world. Could it be that we're actually in Innsbruck once again? It's stop number eight on the Eberspecha Luge World Cup Tour. And yes, we have returned to Innsbruck, a repeat performance, as this is a rescheduled event originally set to be held in Pyeongchang, South Korea. It's been warm all week. It's also been very windy. Fortunately, the wind has died down a little bit. It definitely affected training. Still, the temperature above freezing, the ice just below. This is a track that is familiar to many around the world as they stage at least one race here every year. And the athletes spend a lot of time training on this course. One person who knows this track very well is former Team USA member, doubles specialist, and Olympic medalist, Gordy Shear. Good morning, Gordy. Hi, Tim. Thank you for having me. It's a, a pleasure and an honor to be here with you. Let's check out this track. I'm not sure who's providing this week's POV, but we'll get a look at that in a second. Very tough. Here's Ryan Yeager. Very tough off of this lower start. Yeah, the, the start curve is definitely key. This track is all about gliding and relaxing and minimal but precise steering good body position on the sled with your head back your feet in optimal aerodynamic position this is one of the key areas here at curve nine you can see the slide the slider in this video is actually dropping his feet to make a minor correction correction here's another really tricky part if you get the exit into this lower labyrinth section you're good to go if you're offline it's going to be a problem we've said this a lot gordy over the last couple of years there was a time where it was curve nine and nothing else here at Innsbruck. You just had to, uh, you had to perfect curve number nine as we check out the start list, 24 in the field. That's two more than they had in the opening race here in November. Now the track really is kind of the, that's lower start curve for the women in the doubles. It's right before Kreisel. It's exiting 10 properly for the lower labyrinth. There, there's really no end to the challenge. Yeah, it's probably the combined fact that uh, the speeds of the sleds are getting faster, the pressures are changing, and uh, and also the ice is always, you know, is always so well built, typically here at in Innsbruck. First up, we will have the team from the Ukraine. Two Ukrainian doubles teams on board today. This is Yor Hoy and Roskilevich Lekjevich. And they're ranked number 23 in the World Cup standings. They finished 21st and second to last in the race here in November. And uh, your little preview coming up very late in today's race, Gordy. We've got the Austrian Stoyan Kohler and the two German sleds, the Tobies and uh, Egert Benneken. This is the second to last race for the World Cup title, and the standings are still pretty tight, so it will be fun. Yeah, it's hard to believe we're so early in the season talking about the second to the last race when normally, you know, we'd be pretty well in the middle of the season at this point. Well, last week in the men's competition, Felix Locke all but knocked off the World Cup, clinched it on January 16th. And last year, you had to go all the way to March to find the World Cup title decided. So that's a strange year. A little bit of uh, skidding going into the finish curve. It's a uphill. That uphill is used to scrub off speed and uh, slow the sleds down. There's no brakes on this thing. 40.713. That's 1.3 seconds off of the track record, which we saw some track records finally fall the last couple of weeks, but in these warm conditions, it may not happen today. Yeah, it, you never know, but I, I don't know that we're in uh, optimal conditions for track records. Usually around 10 degrees, low humidity, that's when you're going to see track records fall, assuming that the track crew has done a good job building the ice. One down, 23 to come here, and if you are up early enjoying the action, uh, you're crazier than we are. Thanks for waking up. You're a sliding sports fan indeed, and we'd love to hear from you on Twitter, at Luge Announcer, by email, luge.announcer at gmail.com, and uh, we welcome all of your remarks. And now that's a good view of that challenge right up at the start ramp. And it was a nice job on the start, actually. You saw that the, the athletes pull off, paddle in unison, settle into the sled, 
the sled moved to the right a little bit, which allows the, the team to then turn the sled to the left and make a nice smooth merge onto the start curve. This is a nice looking run so far. A beautiful exit off of that challenging curve nine. Makes a nice smooth entry onto the next curve, which is curve 10. I was just uh, listening to an interview. I see it's a relatively clean uphill to the finish in second place. Interview with the, the president of your federation and a former teammate of yours, Erin Warren. And uh, Erin was on Brenna's podcast and she was discussing how you, if you get off of nine, okay, then you've got that straightaway right after here into 10. And that's so important to actually have the perfect line into 10. Yeah, it really gives you a chance to also think, of, it gives you a chance to think, because setting up curve 10 is really critical to having a nice lower labyrinth. If you can get that curve 10 exit and drive the sled all the way to the end of it, which is something that a lot of people forget to do, uh, it'll set you up really nicely. Stakov and Lisetsky, also from the Ukraine, a very nice 15th place finisher, finish rather, uh, at the World Cup opener here in Innsbruck in late November. That got him into the sprint competition. And for reasons I'm not totally sure, this is another sprint weekend, only four of them all year, but two of them here in Innsbruck. Ooh, uh, you saw the previous sled settle and go to the right. These guys had a little bit of direction to the left, which makes makes it a little more challenging to smooth out the upper few corners there. Uh, but they did a good job to make a correction. You see the athlete lifting his head going into curve eight. Uh, the more you pick your head up, the slower you go. So uh, you really want to see athletes pushing that head back to create better airflow. Now into this curve 11, 12, 13 lower labyrinth combination. Not that steep at this point. And in fact, the only steepness is right here uphill across the finish line, 40.524, the first place time here among the first three sleds. We're just outside of Innsbruck in the little village of Eagles. A, a, a beautiful spot. I mean, uh, you know, the views are second to none. And yeah, I think a lot of the athletes like coming here. If I'm not mistaken, Gordy, is this the track where you and Chris won your first World Cup medal? Uh, yes, this is the season opener typically. And yeah, that would have been the 93 season, I believe. I was 92, 93, yeah. I was in the house. I remember yeah. that was very exciting. It was a big breakthrough for the USA program as we have our first of two consecutive Romanian sleds, Anderic and Alani, both 19 years old, on course. Yeah, so you guys broke the ice, so to speak. I think there may have been one or two uh, sort of anomaly uh, World Cup podiums on, on smaller fields before that. But, but the two of you, uh, with, with Mark and Brian on your heels, started a long string of USA doubles domination. Yeah, uh, you know, I think our, our head coach, Wolfgang Shadler, had really found some time in our sleds. Uh, we were, the four of us, collectively worked very hard together. So. It culminated, of course, with the Olympic medals in 1998 as this Romanian team crosses into the lead by 1300s. But prior to that, I believe two years after uh, you guys won that first of the World Cup medals, the United States swept all three positions in a World Cup race in doubles in Lillehammer. Yeah, yeah, that was a historic moment for the team, and then uh, we actually repeated it with our women in Lake Placid in 2015. That's a little right. A little bit high, sorry, I just want to talk to position here a little bit. You can see the sled was just a hair off line. You can see the top end sit up and break position for just a second. And the temptation to break form there is so strong, especially when the sled goes a little bit offline. Sorry about that, Tim. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> just, ha just having fun reminiscing, that's all. Yeah. yeah. No, just, there aren't a lot of occasions in this sport where uh, one nation sweeps all three podiums. Any discipline, any event. It's happened several times, of course, with the Germans. 
And now we have our next Romanian team, Vasily Zitland, Darius Serban. 27 nice is their ranking right now in the World Cup. Their best result in 18th place last week in Oberhof. Yeah, they did a, a nice job on the start. The uh, It was interesting to see the way the, the, the bottom driver, his hands, his wrists were rotated at an odd angle, which I, I don't see a lot of. I think I understand the, the theory of what he's doing, but I've just never seen it before. Obviously trying to get as much speed and power at the start as possible, as that's the only place you can really accelerate the sled. Now the lower S's, the chicanes, the labyrinth, they, they go by different names on different tracks. And it's been relatively clean action here among the first five sleds. It's been nice to see. Definitely. Saw a little bit of ice being cut down uh, in the, the labyrinth. Again, it's so easy to get offline there. And, and there's really a rhythm to this lower labyrinth. Uh, and, you know, the key is to kind of add a curve 10, get into curve 11, you feel there's almost like a pocket, and then you can just, a, a very slight right shoulder, sink into the right, the back end of your sled, that right shoulder right there. And if you can get into that rhythm, the lower labyrinth can work really nicely for you. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, this is an event that was originally scheduled to be held on the Olympic track in South Korea, Pyeongchang. It would have been the first race back in South Korea since the Olympic Games. Uh, bad news for these two. The race, of course, has been moved here in Innsbruck. In fact, uh, the Koreans, Gordy, only got the green light to join the tour about a week before the last Innsbruck race in November. So they headed over to Europe. They haven't been home since. It's a little bittersweet this weekend for Park and Cho. I've always been impressed with this team. That's a nice job at the start. They've got this little, probably, maybe started to drive into the start curve a little bit soon, perhaps, or not aggressive enough. It's tough to tell from the angle, but, um, you know, these guys are just, you know, really solid. They were, uh, learned how to slide under uh, the Korean coaches at the time, which is uh, Stefan uh, Sartor and Robert Fegg, a little problem out of curve nine. But those guys did a good job of really showing these guys the ropes. And uh, Robert, of course, now is uh, the head coach of Team USA. As the Koreans are trailing right now by four hundredths of a second, they come to the finish line and find the time down at the bottom, get into the green, and take the lead six sleds in. So Beck is coaching the USA. What about Stefan? Is he, did he hook on with anyone, or is he back in Altenburg? He's with the uh, German junior program. Great. Great to hear. You see coordination on the paddles. That's really important. You know, moving the double sled together as one is really critical to having a lot of uh, efficiency at the start. Head position a little high because he's obviously feeling the sled moving to his right. Good job of correcting it though. Koreans out in front, Slovakians getting ready and very few people to watch the action live here as you can see in that Finnish corral only coaches one or two medium members only. Bobercek and Schmich grabbing the handles Two 21 year olds from Slovakia. Decent year for them, Gordy. Top 20 in every race, which is uh, as high as 16th, or actually as high as a 15th place finish in Koenigsegg. Yeah, I was uh, very impressed with that start. I, you know, one thing I, you want as a, I, I'm a music guy and, and <laughs> I can try to listen, and if you hear, it sounds like there's some cutting going on with this sled. There's a lot of noise, and I'm not sure it's the kind of noise I like. Sounds like your hi-hat is broken, are you saying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it just, it sounds a little rough. And that sound may have translated to loss of time on the way down, because they had the green for most of the way in the end, they're in third place right now, five hundredths 
behind the South Koreans. This is the, the Kreisel, it's a 270 degree, 70 degree corner. And you wanna set up the exit so that your uh, middle, middle left going into that curve eight. Little breaks in form here down at the bottom. We have two Russian sleds consecutively coming up now. Let's see if these guys, though, get the green light or the red light. They get the green. They were pretty uh, nonchalant about that. She's great, just walking by. This is a Russian team that showed up out of nowhere last weekend, uh, in part because Yushikov, the veteran Russian, made the surprise retirement announcement two weeks ago. So these two entered the scene. They raced once, then did not qualify, and they're having a little trouble off of the start there. Yeah, even just with their paddles, it just seems like there's a lack of confidence, a lack of comfort. I don't know how many runs these guys have here, uh, so it's, it's difficult to tell. But a little bit uh, late into curve eight, they're, they're just not quite on, it seems, right right on this run. Buchnev and Kelsiev, they've had at least seven runs. We do know that, because that's the minimum that a brand new team could have on a new track when they arrived that week. 40.34 is their fourth place time. Their veteran Olympic medal winning teammates are coming up next. Still ahead, we have the top three from yesterday's Nations Cup qualifying, including the USA and Canada. And then all of the leading Italians, Latvians, Russians, and Austrians, not to mention the Germans, still to come. There was that problem with the start curve. I, I, like I said, it just didn't seem like they had a lot of comfort going down that ramp. And then uh, here out of curve nine, a foot down. I, I think this is, to your point, Tim, they were probably called into this and maybe are not quite there mentally yet. Still a great opportunity for them, so they can, Absolutely. They can only build on that. Okay, Denisov and Antonov, Alexander and Vladislav. They've been around the World Cup action dating all the way back to 2010. They finished as high as fourth place in the World Cup overall, and that was just last season when they captured two of their four World Cup wins. They do very well in the sprint, and again, this is a sprint weekend. And I find it a little odd. Again, three World Cup sprint races this year, one at the World Championships. Two of those three are on this track. But that may just be because it was the schedule originally for South Korea to hold the sprint here. Yeah, certainly uh, COVID has, has done a lot to alter the, the schedule this season. It, it just would have been fun, Gordy, to see the sprint at San Moritz because that's the track where you have miles and miles not literally <laughs> but you have, you have a lot of time to pick up that speed well, they separated themselves pretty widely from the rest of the field three tenths of a second up right now for denisov and antonov as we get ready for the top three from yesterday's qualifying no surprise there uh, these guys a lot of experience comfortable on the track they know where to find the time and you know they stay stay nice and calm and smooth down here in the lower labyrinth Russia in the lead business as usual for this pair who captured Olympic silver in 2014 in the team relay event third place yesterday in the one heat stressful Nations Cup qualifying event were the Poles, Wojciech Chimilewski and Jakub Kovalevsky. It's not a stellar year for this pair as they're back in 14th place in the World Cup standings. A lot of people thought that they were uh, ready for prime time, ready to be regular top 10 finishers, but they've had just one top 10 and eighth in Segura. Yeah, I think it was Innsbruck a year ago that the, uh, these guys were actually in I believe these guys were in medal contention. They were in the lead the after the first run. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It was one of those crazy warm days, of course, but uh, and they fell back. But they did win a medal later in the season. Yeah, yeah. 
deservingly so. These guys are good sliders. And, you know, it, it, it's hard to be ooh, a little bit offline here in the bottom, but doing a nice job of staying cool. Two tenths of a second and back to the Russians. Early on, Gordy, today you mentioned, of course, there are no brakes, and you see the front man lifting up the sled to slow it down. What can you do if danger is lurking mid run? Not, not much, right? Well, you can drop your feet to try and help stabilize things, but sometimes dropping your feet is actually the exact wrong thing to do uh, because that's sort of the equivalent of letting go of the steering wheel. It really takes away, you can see, uh, there's your, your bump, just crossing at odd angles here. But you, you, the temptation is to drop your feet to try and gain control of the sled. And it does work sometimes, but not always. So the answer is not much. The top two in yesterday's qualifying event, both athletes and sleds from North America. The Canadians are on deck. Here's the United States, Chris Master and Jason Turdeman. Both uh, of these nations skipped the first half of the season, and as a result, no prior result this year in Innsbruck for Mazda and Turdeman. Pretty smooth there. Nice looking start curve. I think I would have liked to have seen Chris reach a little bit more forward on his paddles and get a little more power. But, you know, you also got to remember Chris is coming off of a couple of surgeries, uh, elbow and shoulder in the spring and a shoulder the year before that. So, uh, you know, you got to cut the guy some slack. Definitely, and he sees the busiest man in the sport today. Men's race coming up just after the doubles competition. Three hundreds back. Now we'll see if this sled is set up. They almost hugged the wall there, curve 12. And as a result, they cannot find the green. They're six thousandths of a second behind the Russians. Yeah, a little bit of direction uh, going into uh, in the lower labyrinth into uh, 13. And the good news is you don't lose a ton of time down there. So this is curves 11, 12. And then, yeah, just got a little early onto, onto, tw onto, pardon me. You start getting into that early progression and it just tends to get worse and worse as you move down through those labyrinth curves. See on the side of the track that thank Baldwin, USA coach has returned to action. That's good to see. Now the Canadians. And Olympic silver medal winners, Tristan Walker and Justin Smith, part of that Team Canada relay performance at the Olympics in South Korea. Walker and Smith captured the Nations Cup race yesterday. A little high on the start curve, but a nice job getting things back. These guys... It's certainly nice to see the two North American teams back in action and sort of climbing up into the Nations Cup, and you know, maybe we'll see them move out of Nations Cup qualifying for the final race. A bit of a quiet entry into this season for the Canadians with an 18th place and a 10th place in their first two races. As you see, though, they've made it from green in or red into green, and then they lose it again down at the bottom. So a bit mystifying. The lines look pretty good, Gordy. Yeah, I think I, I saw a little spot going into the finish curve uh, between uh, 13 and, and the finish curve. I think I saw a little bit of strange direction, which perhaps cost them. Well, this is the exit of the Chrysler, and that was certainly clean, and now the exit of curve nine. You can see the sled cutting ice on the exit there. It's really tough. You, it, it's easy to drive a nice line Nah, nothing's easy, but it's, it's uh, you know, coming off, you can see that ice being cut and spray coming out from underneath their, their steel runners. And anytime you see that, it's it's time. So not easy to do it smoothly. Yes, th thanks for pointing out that nothing's easy, especially going 68 miles per hour around some tight curves. Three Italians 
all having solid seasons. Pay no attention to that graphic because these are the Italians and the pair of Emmanuel Rita and Simone Kainzbaldner. They're ranked number seven in the World Cup. No podiums yet, but they've had three top fives, including a fourth place finish in the opening sprint in Innsbruck in November. Taking a lot of time getting ready here. Oh, there they go, got the uh, clearance. All right, Gordy, we have a question coming to us from Ken, watching uh, in North Carolina this morning. Ken wants to know, with the quiet track, can you really hear the music playing at the start? And if so, even if not, Gordy, what would be your choice of music <laughs> to have play when you're on course? <laughs> well, uh, yes, you can hear it, but you know, it, it's just sort of background, and, and um, I don't know. I, Personally, the music choice never really uh, made a difference for me, but a lot of people get really fired up by the right kind of music. Uh, you know, I, I think most people are really uh, focused on the task at hand. 39.853, a pretty good task at hand for the first of the three Italians as they take a sizable lead over the Russians, the USA, and Canada. We're midway through this run number one. Hey, Gordy, I, I, at the last Olympics, I was covering the halfpipe, snowboard halfpipe, and it amazed me that before every athlete went down, they threw their earbuds in, they adjusted the volume on their players, and uh, they were ready to go. So, so clearly, the music is a very important component to their run. Yeah. Robin Goyaka and David Gamm, the first of three Germans. We've been talking about this story over the past several weeks. Next week are the World Championships. And only three double sleds, four single sleds in each discipline are entered. And Goyaka and Gamm are far from being assured of their spot in the World Championship field. Yeah. It's the perpetual race within these races amongst the different teams is to hit your qualification marks to make that world championship appearance. They are world championship medalists back in 2016, maybe even 2017, but they're trailing by a pretty wide margin right now and in danger of falling behind not just the Italians and the Russians, but the Americans and the Canadians. They are in fifth place right now, 40.05. And I'm not sure if Orla Munder and Gubitz, that's the, the fourth of the German doubles teams, but uh, they may be licking their chops right now, thinking about the worlds. Yeah, I, I would say that anything's possible at this point. A nice looking star curve, you can see they sink in to the sled. Here's where their problems began though. Out of curve nine, a little bit of right direction and then overcorrected, and then did a nice job to not drop his feet. Uh, but that's where they probably bled some time away. Robin doing a nice job getting that face mask strap or trying to around the helmet. <laughs> uh, easier said than done. Moving on with the action now, run number one, Innsbruck, Austria, the eighth World Cup of the season, and this has been the breakout team in the sport of luge, bar none. The Latvian doubles team of Bots and Pluma. This is their first year. They were in podium position, or close to it, in the opening race, their debut in November, ended up in eighth place, but came all the way up to a podium spot two weeks ago in Sigulda. Effective, short, shorter than you typically see uh, in their, their paddle uh, cadence, but very effective. They could definitely see the sled being accelerated forward, and they did a nice job of driving that start curve. They're in the green. They were fast all week during training. We've got to learn a bit more about these guys because they may be around to stay. Yeah, and I would expect them to build more speed down here in the bottom. That's sort of how these Latvian sleds have been running this year. 
uphill to the finish, and they have a first place time of 39.780. That's three tenths off of the track record. And another maybe one or two tenths can be possibly had today, but I don't, I, as I said earlier, I don't believe the track record. I tend to agree with you. Nice job here into curve 11. You notice a little bit of sitting up between those transitions, but that's, that's to be expected, uh, especially for a team this young. Well, one reason this Latvian team is so successful so quickly is because they have good mentoring. The Sheiks brothers coming up a little later on, the greatest of all Latvian losers in terms of hardware. You've got Putins and Marcinkiewicz who are not touring this year. They've got a World Cup win. And, and you have this veteran group, Oskars Gudramovic and Pateras Kalmans, both 32 years old, both from the capital city of Riga, which really isn't that far from the Segulda track. They settled down the ramp a little bit more middle as opposed to middle right, which made that start curve a little bit choppier. But we'll see how these guys can bounce back. And again, they're, they're uh, over a tenth back at the start, so definitely lost a little bit of time there. Inconsistent team uh, season for this duo, who finished as high as fourth, but several times in the lower teams as well. At the interval they had, yeah they, they did a good job of stopping the bleeding to be uh, to be over a tenth back and only 15 hundredths down at the bottom uh, it shows that they did have a decent run Latvia Italia Latvia the top three right now we are 16 sleds in with eight to, to still come We're getting into the, the meat of things here. And that meat starts with our next Italian team, Ivan Nagler, Fabian Malaya. Again, that's the finish area. It's, a, it's an area usually crowded with coaches and athletes, and then right across the outrun are bleachers which we have seen filled with screaming fans, especially during the World Championship here in 2017. Yeah, it's kind of a bummer. This is usually a very animated crowd. Ivan Nagla, Fabian Malaya. A good morning to our Luge fans up early watching in Italy. Lots of fans, not just in the Sioux Tyrolean region, but we know of uh, people that wake up and enjoy their luge in Milan, of course, Torino. And these guys should be comfortable on this track. It is, even though we're we're in Innsbruck, uh, this is considered their home track, as the vast majority are, are South Tyrolean athletes, as you mentioned, Tim. Maybe a one-hour tops 90-minute drive to this track from Northern Italy. Of course, gonna be close here at the finish, Tim. Five hundreds, and they're in second place. How about that young Latvian team, Bots and Plum, continuing the lead? Yeah, you you were you were right on when you called that one, Tim. Bots and Plum definitely put down a nice first run. Look at all the ice flying off the. Uh, off of their start, that's a great shot. Yeah. A hey, quick question coming in from Craig, another one of our regular viewers and writers. And Craig wants to know, would a loser only have a single face shield or would it vary if it were, say, a super sunny day or a night race, for example? Uh, as long as there's no scratches and as long as you can keep the thing clean, you, you try and get as much life out of that face shield. Uh, you used to see some of those yellow tints uh, but I haven't seen much of that lately. Thanks for that question, Craig. 
The third of the three Russian teams now <laughs> grabbing the handles. And there's that yellow tint. Yeah. <laughs> our director, Britta, maybe, or Reiner, the director, Britta, the producer, maybe heard you from 2,000 miles away. <laughs> that is funny. Four good paddles. You have to be really careful with the paddles here in Eagles. Not particularly strong with the start time. No, but uh, nicely driven start curve. And that often will reflect in this next split. But not in this case. Tenth of a second back. So now through curve nine. Curve ten coming up, Gordy. This is one of the last of the great high walls in the sport, right? Yeah, and you know, it's funny you mention that. I, they've actually lowered curve 10 a little bit. Ooh, up on one runner, going into curve 13. Uh, but they've actually lowered a lot of those super high corners. They did some of that in their work in, um, in Oberhof right. as well, lowering those corners. Lake Placid has that shady two curve, which curve 10, I guess it is. That, that, that continues to be a pretty tall one, right? And 17 as well. Uh, Lake Placid's got a couple of them. And those corners are interesting because they actually don't go to vertical right away. So they, there's a lot of different lines you can drive through there, but it can also create some excitement. And, yeah, they were, you see they were actually going up on one runner uh, with headed direction headed into curve 13. And, again, staying cool is so important in the sport. You can really uh, hide a lot of, uh, of your issues and, and get you through some serious problems. All right, I'm not hyping things up, Gordy, when I say that the race really begins now because at least on balance this season, the next six teams making up the, the super seed, if it will, uh, are not only among the top six in the World Cup standings by uh, basis of consistent results, they really are week in and week out the top six. Very few other sleds have hopped into the top six this year. First, we start with the Olympic champions from Bavaria, Bendel and Alt. One 18th place finish, everything else top five this year, including one, two, three, four, five, six podiums, and one race win. Uh, these guys have pretty much written the book on doubles for the past, uh, oh God, decade. And a little bit probably not quite as good as they want it to be on that start curve. So a little bit of a high line. Uh, cost them some time, but watch for them to make some time perhaps here at the bottom. 500 soft, I would never count these guys out of anything. No podiums in the first two races held here in Innsbruck in November, but both top fives a fourth and a fifth. They've been in the red solidly all the way down here. And losing time. Interesting, as the Tobies come up in fourth place, 1500s back, not much Norbert can say about that one, 39.929, and it's looking more and more like the young Latvian team. Wow, Gordy, this is amazing. Yeah, you know, uh, some years you have a track's number, and other years the track has your number, and maybe that's just the case with, this guy, with these guys this season. Yeah, again, that's where they lost a lot of their time. Just very rough into the start curve. And when you make a problem like that at the top of the course, it becomes very difficult to make that time back. It, the problem just, uh, from a time, time standpoint, the problem just multiplies as you get further down the track. Young Latvians notwithstanding, Germans notwithstanding, the pre-race favorite in most people's mind, the next duo coming up from Austria, Thomas Stoy and Lorenz Kohler. They hold a 96-point lead in the World Cup standings over the Germans. They've won four races, including the two held earlier here in Innsbruck and the one held last week in Oberhof. You see Stoy actually hooked, we call that hook steering, he used his heel to lift the opposite, uh, not the, to lift the runner off of the ice a little bit and gain a little extra crank and drive. Thousandth of a second, their advantage. They know this track better than anyone, that is for sure. I would expect that advantage to build at this point. There's no ice like home ice. It goes from a thousandth to a hundredth. No mistakes down here at the bottom. 
this will Very be the lead. Not a lot though, Gordy. No, not a lot, but this is this is Eagles. Eagles racing is always close. Margins are hundreds of seconds. There's definitely some time in that run for these guys. It wasn't perfect, but that comfort of knowing the track and being able to just, just it's just confidence really. Knowing exactly where to where to drive, when to drive, how long to drive, how hard to drive. Those are little things that you gain over time and gain a lot of comfort. That was just gorgeous at a curve nine. Just perfect. You didn't see any ice being cut. It sets them up middle to middle right into curve 10. That was that was well done. The Austrians into the lead. The final German set coming up next at under 900 meters. This is one of the shortest tracks in the world. In fact, this uh, this lower start area for the doubles, not far from the Kreisel, as the crow flies, is only about 200 meters from the finish as, as the course loops around through the forest back to nearly the same spot. Egert and Vanneken trail the Austrians in the World Cup standings. They're in second place. They've had three race wins so far this year. That's second most on tour. Three other podiums. They've had two uncharacteristic crashes this year. Not perfect lines. You saw them take the start curve. We call that taking it twice. They got on, they got bumped down, and they, they got back up on the, the curve at the very end and got bumped down again. And with that Kreisel being one of the first big tests, if you don't carry all of the speed you can, that, that does not bode well, does it? Yeah, I'm not seeing a lot of comfort in this run. I saw uh, some corrections between curves eight and nine. Well, they're but only 7,000. They're, they're building time. time. They are building time, that's for sure. It's that magical sled setup you often get from Tony oh. and Sasha as they do it. This is going to be a great second run. Oh. Number two leading number one in terms of World Cup standings. Egert Benneken out in front of Stoyan Kohler, but by the slimmest of margins with the Latvians hanging on to a top three at the moment with three remaining. Well, I would definitely say that that uh, Eggert and Benneken have left a little bit on the table here in, in terms of time. You see them bump off. There's that second little bump on the star curve that I was talking about. And down at the bottom, they just seem to, to build time here somehow. His position's a little bit high, uh, but as you alluded to, their, their sled setup is very nice. The Latvian brothers up next, Sheiks and Sheiks, who earlier this year won their third career World Cup race to go along with three Olympic medals. Really quick question, Gordy, from Kuba, who I believe we established last week is watching from Poland. He uh, wants to know, do you think that the races will be back in the USA and Canada next year? I think they will, yes. And, and he has a follow-up. What about natural track races? Will they ever return? Nater Bond back to North America. I hope so. Yeah, that would be great. Now the Latvians, they do it better than anyone on any track. Very consistent. Uh, that was a, a beautiful start curve. And, you know, this is a shorter track, as you alluded to earlier, but it's also a track that, um, you know, gives a great chance for gliding drivers like these guys. These guys can drive the sled well any place, but we'll see if they have enough time to make up down here at the bottom. 400's back. It'll need to be perfect here to move ahead of their teammates into the top three. Beautiful, beautiful lines down at the bottom. Fourth place, and they're just 200's behind Bots and Pluma, the other Italian team. So it's Germany, Austria, Latvia, Latvia, and then a pair of Italians. That's the top six with the final two still to come. Yeah, because this track is so short, you're going to see, you know, some, some incredibly tight racing. And no surprise, feet a little bit uneven. Now, the, the feet are really important, Tim, because the first thing that comes into contact with the wind is your feet. So foot position is critical. Now our final two sleds are getting set to go down this course here in 
Innsbruck, two-time Olympic track, actually really one-time Olympic track, because it was an entirely different course back in the 1964 games, but in 1976, when Innsbruck got the last minute call to host the second Olympics, they finished this artificially refrigerated track. Here from Italy, Ludwig Rieder, Patrick Rassner, fifth in the World Cup standings. Six top five finishes this year. So it's been a solid, consistent year for them, including a podium in Innsbruck in November. Once again, uh, competing on their home track. So a lot of runs down this ice. High levels of confidence, looking very good. Italy will host the 2026 Olympic Games, and because of that, they are rebuilding the track in Cortina, Italy. It's also not that far from the Sioux Tyrolean base of this Italian Luge Federation. Let's see if they can hang on to this lead. Look, look pretty good. They hang on, they do it nicely. O only a tenth of a second, less than a tenth, separate the top three. Fourth place, just over a tenth of a second. Gordy, it's gonna be a great second run. Yeah, it will. These guys are pumped. I mean, you know, that was uh, that was a solid, solid run. And they had, uh, they drove the top portion of this track beautifully. Uh, coming out of, out of the Chrysler, they were over a tenth up. So they really nailed that upper portion of the track. Now they have never won a World Cup race despite all of those consistent top five finishes. So that would be exciting for them to say the least, heading into the World Championship next week in Koenigsee. And great for the Italian program, too. You know, it, it's been a while since we've seen an Italian double sled that's uh, right. win a race. That's correct, yeah. We gotta get our researchers in on that. Final sled here in run number one. Two former singles losers come doubles. Yannick Müller. Armin Frausche in the best of times. They've been on the podium as they were here in Innsbruck to open the season. In the worst of times, they've crashed here in Innsbruck, which they did, Gordy, yesterday in the seeded training. It just goes to show that mistakes can happen to anybody. I don't think with that start, start curve, they're gonna be in contention here today up against uh, what we saw from the Italians. This is the Kreisel Corner, one of several in the world, including next week in Koenigsee, there's a Kreisel Corner at the World Championships. They're two tenths of a second back already. Yeah, that was definitely a result of the, the start. And as I, as I said, you know, you make a mistake at the top and it can be very difficult to find that time down at the bottom. Men's competition later this morning the women in the sprint tomorrow, but run number one of the doubles concludes with an eighth place time for the Austrians. One Austrian team in contention right now, but two Latvians, two or three Italians in the top seven, and one German sled. You saw, on, you saw the uh, coach reacting to the, uh, the, the start, and kind of mimicking the paddles as we watch them out of curve nine. Not a bad exit of curve nine, but again, looking at the ice coming up from underneath the sled, uh, just not not as perfect as we saw from the Italians and, and uh, the Austrian team with Stoy Kohler. A totally different dynamic, Gordy, as without their friends and family here, I'm not sure whether that means less pressure or less support for the home nation. I think it depends on each team and athlete. Some people feed off that, that uh, excitement. Check out how close it is, 800 separating the top three, and then you've got fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, all really in podium position entering run number two. The Austrians, whom we just saw, are in eighth. The USA will need to move up a couple of spots to have their best result of the season. Goyaka and Gam complete the top 15 keeping in mind that only the top 15 at the end of run number two will qualify for tomorrow's sprint competition.